Crimson London's calling, everybody. <laughs> we're here for another year. It's awesome, and we're completely sold out again. Um, we've taken over the whole venue this time, so uh, we can kind of get more people in. Now, who came last year? Oh, that's good. So it wasn't just a fluke. Okay, cool. <laughs> um, yes, move on. Um, yes, and then, oh yes, a hashtag. If you ever want to tweet during the night day is hash LC2017, which is always good. Um, and, but this event, um, it takes a lot of work to put this event on. And these are the team that put it together. So, thank you. <laughs> It's completely non-profit. We don't make any money out of this. Um, and it is a lot of work. So thank you so much for coming and supporting this awesome community that is Salesforce. Um, just a quick word for our sponsors, because without the sponsors, we really could not put this event on. Um, keep clicking. I don't know what I did with this. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Um, they're downstairs. Have a chat with them. Talk to them. Find out about their product, because you never know in the future. Uh, and also, we have got in your event guide, there's a little bit of paper, which is basically a sticker sheet. Now, if you get six or more stickers on it, then you'll be put into a draw for a prize at the keynote at the end of the day. And if you go to a, a sponsor, find out about their product, they'll give you a sticker to put on the sticker sheet. And the prizes are pretty awesome, aren't they, Jodie? Yeah, they are. <laughs> um, and I can't remember what else I put in the slide deck. Is that, oh yeah, that's the sticker sheet. Yeah, there it is, that's it. And then, oh yes, the sessions. I'll pass over to Simon for this. Hello, I'm gonna use a mic. It's controversial, I understand. Um, okay, so uh, we've got lots of speakers again. That's why you're all here, because we've got an amazing lineup of content. Um, there is one change, actually kind of two changes, but let's go with one change first. Um, at 10.55 in the command room, we're supposed to be having, do you have visions? Einstein can help. Does anybody come for that? I'm really sorry. Uh, Rene uh, is, is very sick and can't make it. So um, we have substituted him. We have uh, Philippe Ozil. Uh, he is going to be talking not about that. He is going to be, is he in the room? Is he? Yeah, yeah. He's, there he is. Look. Thank you, Philippe. Honestly, he stood in yesterday. So, you know, go to a session. Uh, he's going to be talking about VR and Salesforce. Okay, so that's just the one change there. Um, that, that's pretty much the end of the slides. Yeah. So the. I guess the other big change is, um, as you know, uh, there are some interesting events unfolding around the world at the moment. Um, and because of those, traveling in and out of the US is a little chaotic. Uh, and Mr. Peter Coffey wasn't able to make it here today, okay? Um, he's, he was so caught up with his connections and it was gonna be really tight to actually make it in and out and he was worried about delays. So he said, I'm not going to be able to make it, but do not panic. Look, there he is. Okay? He is still here, everybody. Um, we have the technology. We are all involved in technology. And as the world changes, if we can't make use of this technology con to continue our business and to grow and to be better people, then frankly, we all just need to go and get other jobs. Okay? So we are making use of the technology. We are going to stream Peter in live. It's 1 a.m. in the morning for him. Don't feel that sympathetic. <laughs> It was his idea, okay? Uh, yeah, so otherwise, the man that needs no introduction, Mr. Peter Coffey, um, I'll hand over to him. Um, you m he's on mute, so he doesn't even know. You're gonna have to bear with us as a technology, right? I just all my speech there about technology, and now we, can't, now we can't work it. Oh yeah, there is one last thing. <sighs> right, downstairs, we have a trailhead room. First thing in the morning, it's gonna have a couple of sessions in, then for the rest of the day, it's gonna be a room for doing trailhead badges in, okay? or ask the experts as well. So, go down there, ask any questions, get some help, do some badges. The one badge I need everybody in this room to do is the business value of equality, all right? Because we all believe in equality, we're gonna go and learn about the business value of it and it's gonna fit in fantastically with a whole day. Hopefully you've seen our keynote at the end of the day, okay? Around empathy and equality and all that kind of stuff. So you're gonna go and get that badge. If you don't get that badge, you don't get to leave the building. All right, and then when you've got that badge, you're gonna come back upstairs, you're gonna get a physical badge, and then we're gonna do a cheesy marketing shot, everybody holding their badge up, all right? And you're all gonna be in it, and it's gonna be all over the world, and you guys, you're all the trailblazers out there, and you're gonna get 100%, 100% of you are gonna do this, yes? I'm gonna go and do it now, not after the keynote. Yeah? yeah? Come on, be enthusiastic. 
It's 10 past nine, people. Wake up. Come on. Awesome. Right. So I'm going to hand over to Peter. Yeah. Swag? Oh. They give me a microphone and then they keep telling me things to say. Okay. Um, swag and T-shirts are downstairs. Um, they'll be there all day, just at the bottom of the stairs. So go and help yourself as you go through. All right. Pick them up. Is that what you wanted me to say? Any point of the day. There'll be somebody there. If there's not, just take it all, resell it on the streets, <laughs> that kind of stuff, right? Awesome. Can I, give, can I hand over to Peter now? Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah? yeah? Okay. Right, we'll leave the stage, and Jodie can stay there and do AV. Thank you very much. <laughs>
And their faculty at one point looked across the table at me, and I think maybe this was meant as a as a test question when they said, "Well, tell me, do we do you think we need to teach calculus?" And I said, "Well, do I get a choice?" And they said, "Well, what would your alternative be?" I said, "Frankly, I see lots of people using quite poor quality data that they then plug into elaborate equations and do all the beautiful production optimization decisions that they were taught to do in school." And they are magnificently optimizing the wrong thing based on garbage information. And if there was one thing that I could do that would really change the curriculum for the better, it would be to really refocus people's thinking, not on relentless optimization off of what is probably very poor quality information, but something that resembles really actually understanding the world of the data around them. Now, interestingly, a few years after this conversation, I ran across this piece in Harvard Business Review. There was a survey of practitioners in various technical disciplines in which they were invited to suggest a term of art in their field that they feel would be most useful to withdraw and replace with some other word because the word they've been using is confusing the heck out of everybody. And by far, the biggest vote getter was the phrase, statistically significant because most people hear that phrase and think oh it's big it's not big it's just probably not accidental and very small effects can meet tests of statistical significance and the comment made in the article is if we're going to pride ourselves on being data driven organizations if we're going to start you know talking with with great excitement about how the the future of the organization is to take in big data. Well, it would be nice if it weren't a very big pile of very poor quality data. It would be nice, for example, if we were not relying on things like web surveys. I mean, every time I see a web survey, my reaction is, oh, wonderful. You're going to collect the information from people who are in the socioeconomic class that has them hanging out on the internet in the first place that had enough spare time to complete your survey and had a sufficiently extreme opinion that they really, really wanted to do that. And then you're going to draw conclusions about a larger population from this sample. The, the garbage that's being done with love, care, thoroughness, and the best available technology all being applied to garbage data is probably one of the single biggest problems of, of the modern data-driven age. And it comes from the fact that people were not taught stats, that there are managers who think that doing statistics is doing things like figuring out what's an average. I've been known to point out that the average result of flipping a coin is that it lands on edge, but this hardly ever actually happens. And in the same way, naive understanding of what you do with data can lead you to equally stupid conclusions. So this is the first thing. Number one, stop making assumptions, start really mastering the art of knowing where good data lives, what a good experiment design is, what a good survey looks like, and so on. And everything else will then probably have considerably higher quality as a result. So that's A. Um, I mentioned this because there's been a lot of discussion now, and this is you know a much more recent um, observation, where we were talking about AI in the business. And you know, the problem with the label of AI is that it's relentlessly applied to all sorts of very sexy and exciting things. And my feeling is we really need to strip away that label and just say, look, what are you actually trying to do? You're trying to identify patterns, predict outcomes, recommend the next steps, and automate the experiences. I totally do not care if this is called AI. In fact, I wish it were not. Because the point is to understand what's going to happen and allow it to happen more consistently and all of this is informed by a much greater reverence for the quality and the sourcing and the methodology of collecting data. So that's A. B for bridging. What is a database? It's a citadel of data with a wall around it and a moat outside the wall and alligators in the moat and we build these databases and we pride ourselves on what a great job we've done isolating them from things around them that might hurt them or contaminate them. And then we say, oh, wait a minute, this database needs to be connected to that other database over there. So now we've gone to all this trouble of building these walls and moats around our data, and now we have to drill holes and build tunnels and do other things to connect them. 
this is really a bad idea. And if you think about it, in terms of many of the things that we do in the world, like for example, imagine the construction of an automobile. It is in the manufacturer's database and then it is shipped to a distributor and to the distributor's database and then it is delivered to a dealer and then it is sold to an owner and then maybe at some point it is resold to another owner and we go to tremendous trouble to keep track of the identity of this object as it moves from place to place to place to place and we vigorously and expensively construct ways of making that hard to do. We build databases that are these, these, these isolated citadels of data and then wonder why we're having to spend so much time and money and effort integrating across them. Well, there are new models. The blockchain model is one of several models in a much more general family of things called distributed ledgers. Um, the whole point is that a connected chain of shared truth is now feasible to build. Why do we build databases the way we do right now? Well, think about it. At one point, all of the interesting data arose as a byproduct of things that you were doing. You were counting the widgets coming off of your own production line. You were counting the dollars that came in through your own cash register. It was locally generated data so it made sense to store it locally, and it was your property, so it made sense to protect it. Well, now most of the really interesting data in the world arises outside your walls, and most of the value that you add is doing operations on data that you didn't originate. And being able to do this kind of stuff and track these things with structures that are designed for a world where connectivity is almost universal, rapidly approaching free and you know the fact that I'm doing this talk from Los Angeles right now is just a, a small example back in you know, 2010 4G was a brand new thing that wasn't a, a really long time ago and the combination of two things one it's so much less complicated if the asset has its own life and all the things that operate on that asset if the owner is an attribute of the asset instead of the other way around. Now, here's something really interesting. When you change your point of view, sometimes you create a whole new business model. We talked with one customer that produces navigation equipment that gets installed in airplanes. Their product is a box of electronics and gets installed in the dashboard of an aircraft. And there are certain intervals at which this thing has to be inspected and calibrated and you know, certified. And so they have to be able to track that box and the problem is that airplanes may change owners or the box might be moved from one aircraft to another aircraft at some point and it was a really complicated thing to do and they had this idea of well, what would happen if we made the box the customer instead of the person we sold the box to being the customer and we treated the owner of the box as an attribute of the box instead of the box as being the property of the owner they just turned their data model inside out. Interestingly, this is exactly what was done by a little outfit called Altium in Australia back around 2007, one of the first companies that told us at Salesforce that they were using us as a platform, even though we had not at that point proposed that they should do that. They were burning a Salesforce customer ID number into a ROM chip on each of the circuit boards that they sold with the result that they were able to track what testing operations had been done on that board, where it had been installed, who was currently using it, what activities that board was being used to do. This was, in, this was 10 years ago, and they were already treating the connected product as the heart of the operation. And little you know, startup operations like IBM think there might be some um, you know, potential in this distributed ledger model and they are offering distributed ledgers as a service blockchains as a service you can you now have the option of deciding to represent something as a coherent chain of operations on data instead of a bunch of isolated citadels of data and one of the interesting things that I ran across is that there are people who are really enjoying the fact that with Salesforce open API's pushing and pulling data in and out of blockchain APIs on Heroku is a really straightforward thing to do. 
So you don't have to boil the ocean here. You can say to yourself, well, wait a minute. If I'm having trouble with a database integration here, is this the problem trying to tell me that I'm thinking about it the wrong way? Should I, in fact, be thinking of the data layer of the solution I'm building in terms of being a distributed ledger rather than a traditional database? It is time that that should be part of the vocabulary of people building the kinds of systems that I believe most of our customers are really interested in creating today. Uh, it is really easy to destroy value of data, even if the data is accurate, by breaking it up into fragments. One of our own people, Mike Rose, talked about, you know, we're, we're keeping the books of business and society in ways that destroy a lot of the value of what we know. And we can do better. And this is an observation that's been made in the area of healthcare. There have been tests done of distributed ledger models in financial services. Many of you have probably at some point done some kind of securities, you know, share transaction, and there's a three-day settlement period before the, the sale or the purchase you make today is reflected in the books. That settlement time goes from something like three days down to something like 30 seconds when a distributed ledger model is used instead of separate databases that all have to be integrated and synchronized with each other across two different brokerage houses and a battery of tests done by a consortium of some of the world's largest banks was, I am quoting them, 100% successful. So this is not fringe technology. It's not limited to Bitcoin. I've, I've also observed that, that calling blockchain that thing that Bitcoin runs on is like calling the internet that thing that Amazon sells books on. It's not wrong, but it's really, really getting a very tiny fraction of the value of what this thing could be doing. This brings us to C. This may be a little controversial, but work with me here. There's a lot of discussion now on how we need to teach everybody to code, need to teach the kids to code, need to look at all of the people who are not represented properly in the tech labor pool and we need to teach them coding because coding is what's going to be their on-ramp into these these wonderful high-tech careers. My feeling is that that is definitely skating toward where the puck is about not to be. The, the, the teaching of people to code at this point is not quite as bad as teaching them abacus skills but it may possibly be a little bit behind the curve because writing new code, you know, the, the, there's there's been a tendency to call lines of code a product. I think it was either Edgar Dykstra or Niklas Wirth who said we call lines of code a product, but they're really an expense. Writing code is always a bad idea if you have an alternative. And we had an internal conversation within Salesforce recently when I asked the question, how many lines of Apex code have been written? in the roughly 10 years since that uh, language went into preview. Apex code was brand new, had just gone into preview one week before I joined the company in, at, toward the end of January 07. And depending on how you count it, there's somewhere between half a billion and eight billion lines of code running. It depends on whether you call managed packages that are you know, running in several different places, whether you count them more than once, whatever. There's a lot of lines of code out there and I've been known to say every one of those lines of code is a, is a needle in the Peter Coffey voodoo doll. Why did I have to write code for this? <coughs> Why wasn't that just an API that I could invoke or a configuration option? It seems like a really good question. And when you talk about careers in code, it's a lot like driving a truck. Driving a long haul freight truck in the US is a pretty decent job. It's a, 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 not a trivial skill. It, uh, it can you know, make you an independent business person, you know, pulling down the equivalent of $90,000 a year. And this would be like being an enterprise coder with some, a good mix of maybe some Java and some SQL and some other skills. Now, one of the points that's been made about writing software is that the gap between the best people in the field and the merely competent in the field is probably bigger than in almost anything else that human beings do. If you look at the time of a winning runner in the Olympics, the gap between the top three runners and the fourth one who didn't get a medal in the Olympics is maybe sometimes hundredths of a second. But the fastest high school or college track star is probably not very far behind. There's very small performance differences. But with software, I think we know that there really are such things as 10x or 20x 
coders who are that much better. Interestingly, the same is true for driving because a Formula One driver can pull down $30 million a year. Going to driver training, getting your driving license, and learning to drive because you plan to be a Formula One driver someday is kind of like going to a coding camp thinking you're going to wind up being Mark Zuckerberg, when in fact you may be more likely to wind up being the software version of this guy. There's a lot of people out there who will know how to code. It does not mean that it's going to be the on-ramp to a high-wage, high-skilled job. Increasingly, and this is some, uh, something I said on Twitter a while ago, learning to code is going to be something you learn to do the same way you learned how to sharpen a pencil. It's a necessary skill. You might not be able to get a lot done without it, but it's not going to be a career. And being able to think in code is a good thing. But treating it as a career, I think at this point, is probably a little bit behind the curve. So I can't recommend calling yourself a coder. If you're starting to call yourself a coder, it's kind of like calling yourself a driver. Here is a really striking example, and I just this, this only happened a few weeks ago. As you can see, the date on this is January 27th. Some of you may know that um, Google's got a thing that does language translation, and it is a neural net, and you feed it language in one, you know, phrases and sentences in one language, and then phrases and sentences in the other come out. And if you don't like what comes out, you suggest a better translation and so on. Being a neural net, if you know anything about that architecture, there are not lines of code that tell you exactly what it's doing. One of my friends, Scott Fallman at Carnegie Mellon, said, you know, the problem with neural nets is that when you get a neural net working about as well as the best human expert in the field, now you have a black box that you understand as poorly as you understood your human expert. And you cannot audit the code in a neural net, but you can kind of study it. You can kind of do the soft, the, the electronic version of doing an electroencephalograph on a neural net and get, you know, kind of look for patterns in where the activity seems to be. They have come to the conclusion that without being told to do this, this neural net developed its own internal, what they call an interlingua, so that any language is mapped to the interlingua, and then the interlingua can be translated into any other language. So now instead of having order of n squared different connections from one language to another, it is now able to do translation between language A and language C, even if it had only ever been taught to do A to B and B to C. It has now developed spontaneously an internal mapping that allows everything to be brought to a common representation and then from that common representation go out to something else. So this makes quite real a research result that Evans Data Research just put out where they asked software developers, what do you think are the three biggest threats to your career? And the number three, the priority, that is to say the second runner-up as we say at the beauty pageant, second runner-up was premature commitment to something that turned out to go nowhere. And many of you can probably come up with examples. Um, there, are, there are technologies that, that came and disappeared before they ever really acquired any, any real penetration. And since I don't know which of my competitors is in the room, I'm not going to mention any of their technologies by name because that might be rude. The first runner-up was staying committed too long to something that turned out to be a burning platform that is, is going away and you just you, you try to do it one, one time too many. There are other examples of this in industry. For example, uh, it has been shown by a, a group of business school students that you can pretty much mathematically prove that Sony spent too much time and money trying to get one more generation out of the Trinitron picture tube technology when they really should have made the move to flat panels. And that's, an, that, that, that's an example that I think we can all relate to. Um, but what was number one? The number one threat that developers perceive to their own future careers is AI starting to do what they used to get paid to write code to do. And here we have an example. This is actually happening in real life. I've seen stories that Facebook says, oh, yeah, we've got AIs writing our AIs. Um, I'm reminded of the, of the Will Smith line in the movie of iRobot where he says, you've got robots building robots? Well, that's just stupid. The, uh, the notion that you know, Skynet is alive and well, it just hasn't woken up yet, uh, is, is, is very much on my mind these days. But this actually happened. This isn't a theoretical thing that might happen. 
an actual production system on its own without being directed to do it did this very complex thing that would have been you know, a really nice piece of code if a person had written it and it didn't matter for weeks. <coughs> now then there's D. There's a tendency to think of software as like a perfect machine and if it's got bugs, we get rid of the bugs. I've never really liked the expression debugging because software is not a raw material that you dig out of the ground and then progressively refine until it's pure. Everything that we call a bug is something that a person wrote. Bugs are created by people writing the code. They are not naturally occurring contaminations and defects that it makes sense to have to go looking for them. We should be having methods at this point that only produce correct code. But given that, it's also a bad idea to be thinking about software as a static artifact that just sits there and once it's perfect, it's perfect. The environment in which it is being used is changing constantly. The things that you might want to protect against are a continually growing list. And what we should be doing is thinking about this as game theory. And the problem is that just like you know, with the MBA curriculum, people are being taught calculus instead of statistics. Well, they're being taught decision theory, but I have found that in general, the, the curricula that are being taught to managers are about making like production allocation optimization decisions. They are, they are mostly based on having perfect information and then doing the best possible thing given perfect information. Well, I think we all kind of understand that in the modern environment, most of the time you have incomplete information and you are not up against a predictable challenge, but you are working with an intelligent decision maker who is trying to compete against you. And this may be someone with whom you're in a negotiating relationship, or it may be someone who's trying to hack you. Either way, game theory is a discipline that's simply not present in mainstream management education. I think it needs to be. Now, here's an example. And this is, in fact, the article I was reading on the plane that made me realize I needed to do this talk with this architecture. I was reading an article in Financial Times about people with luxury homes, when they have a safe, they're being advised, make sure that the safe has two combinations, the one that you use to open it when everything is normal, and the one that you use to open it when someone's got a gun to your head and is forcing you to open the safe. Because the person who's got the gun to your head cannot tell that you're dialing the special combination. They just see the door open and everything's cool. But in fact, you have just sent an alarm. And I thought, you know, that's just really smart because you've got the house with the gates and the locks and the alarms and everything else, but you're still anticipating that someday someone might get through all those lines of defense and you might need a way of doing this. And I thought, this is really defense in depth. And it just made me realize how many of the systems we build are really quite brittle. They have a super user. They have a person in whom all trust must be placed because people think that, that that's not avoidable. They think that that's an inherent property of computer systems that somebody's got to have, as I sometimes say, the God bit set. And it really isn't true. Uh, Adi Shamir, who's the S in RSA, figured out in 1979, okay, so we're talking 30, a 38-year-old piece of work that you can have an N out of M system, or in this case it's called a K of N system, where I could have like the super user password for a system shared among five people in such a way that any three of them can invoke super user privilege, any three, but no two or no one of them would be able to do that. There is absolutely no obstacle to having server operating systems use K of N systems instead of having super user passwords. There is no technical barrier to doing this, but we are so accustomed to the idea that even what we call multi-factor authentication, well, that's still just ways of making sure that the one person we're trusting really is that person. And if you can use your super user powers to extract data from a machine and then use your super user powers to rewrite the log files to conceal 
what you extracted from that machine, and then hypothetically go off and live in Moscow for a while, oh, wait a minute, that actually happened. The notion that when it's not mathematically necessary to do this, we still do this, really gets me annoyed and realizing that was, was kind of you know, the, the, the axis around which this entire talk spins. So this is, this is the one thing that really made me say, you know, we really have to start asking ourselves, why are we still doing clearly, demonstrably stupid and unnecessary things? Um, here is a, a, a very recent uh, piece of research, again, January 27th, where a thorough study of people's personal habits found that digital security practices are simply not being used. People are choosing bad passwords. There are people who actually think that multi-factor authentication is having a user ID and a password. That is not multi-factor. Multi-factor, as some of you I'm sure know, is typically considered to be something you know, something you have, and something you are. There has been uh, there have been studies done where, for example, people will hang out outside the headquarters of a company with a basket of chocolate bars or T-shirts, and people coming out of the company, uh, coming out of the building, will be briefly, you know, stopped and be told, "Hi, we're we're graduate students at the computer science department, and we're studying people's password choices. We don't want to know your user ID, but would you tell us your password so we can, you know, do some statistics on how complicated are the passwords people use?" Well, coming out of company headquarters, a lot of these people have their company ID badges in plain sight. And I think we all know that user IDs are typically pretty easy to figure out if someone's name is right there in front of you. But for a chocolate bar, people will tell you their password. The behaviors that we have to deal with have not materially changed in 20 or 30 years. But we have the tools available to make ourselves much less dependent on trust of individual humans, and we really need to do that. Then there's E. E is for, this is a twofer, estimation and extrapolation. Most forecasting, I have taught business forecasting disciplines at the graduate level, so I'm, I'm, I'm not making this up. Most forecasting is elaborate efforts to take the past and extend it into the future and Everything that's done in terms of, well, this is seasonally adjusted and everything else, it's still using the past to predict the future. Robert Heinlein once famously said that this is the, the same technique that would have you walking north from the south rim of the canyon because your extrapolation says there's nothing but flat ground for the next 10 miles. The fact is the world does change. And Peter Sondergaard at Gartner said at a symposium last year, the future is not looking at what's happened, the future is measuring what people seem to be trying to do, making measurements. Why is that a novel idea? Well, we didn't used to be able to do that. It used to be if I were in healthcare, for example, I could count the pills that I gave you. I could uh, record the surgical procedures that I performed. The actual health outcome, well, that might happen weeks away in a different place. And, you know, it's, it's way too much trouble to go out and figure out what the health outcome was. So I'm just going to get myself paid for the effort that I exert. And we're going to call that a healthcare system. Well, now, between, you know, the Fitbit on my right wrist and the Apple Watch on my left, I've got a pretty comprehensive idea of what the heck is going on. And if I throw in another few things like a detector on my refrigerator and maybe another one on the toilet, um, I can know a lot about what's going in and what's coming out and what my body's doing in the meantime. And maybe instead of routine visits to the doctor, I can start only going in when the data says, hey, this is interesting. His body's never done that before. Um, let's come in and you know, do some actual tests and figure out what's going on. We have to do this because otherwise the, the healthcare system is not scalable. Every developed economy is getting older quite quickly. The number of people over 70 years of age in some of the developed countries is, is going to start to approach parity with the number younger than that in a, in a very short period of time. All existing market research is essentially garbage. I realize that's a very provocative statement, but let me let me let me talk about this in a little more detail. Um, it's possible to use relatively new techniques, again, this is very recent work over at MIT, T 
to you don't have to use the entire mountain of data to understand what's going on. We're already developing techniques that allow you to take, you know, zettabytes and yottabytes of data and break them out into reasonable subsets that still have the interesting behaviors of the whole. And this is a very important thing to be able to do. And the notion that instead of looking at demographics, you know, looking at age and gender and things like that, we now have the ability to look at sets of behavior, sets of emotions, sets of much more powerful predictors of what people are going to do. And there's increasing material coming out of the uh, history of the most recent presidential election cycle in the U.S. that suggests that there was an extraordinarily sophisticated psychographic operation going on where instead of using demographics the way the losing side did, they really did look at the motivations and behaviors and interests of people in a much more granular way, which of course is exactly the kind of thing we're able to do with the Crux acquisition that we've made at Salesforce. I do not know for a fact whether that uh, technology was used by the, by the winning side in that campaign, and I'm not sure I want to know. Why does measurement matter? Well, for one thing, we're building very rich and complex systems these days. This is an actual error message from an actual piece of software. When I showed this, uh, one of our engineers said, oh, I, I hired the guy who wrote that error message. I want you to imagine that you're in tech support and you're asking the customer, okay, can you tell me please what error message was on the screen right before the machine blew up? Yeah, right. People are not going to be able to describe what they are seeing with the richness and the complexity of the products and experiences we're delivering. So we have to be connected to the device or the process to get meaningful data from it. The other problem is this. I don't know if you've any, ever heard of an exercise called Gorillas in Our Midst. People are shown a videotape of five minutes of people playing basketball and asked to count the number of times that a player in white successfully passes the ball to another player in white. At the end of the five minutes, they're asked, and did you see anything unusual while you were counting the passes? Almost nobody sees the gorilla walk through the frame in the middle of the five minutes. They're not looking for black fuzzy objects moving through the middle. They're looking for round orange objects going back and forth between white objects. People are on task and saying, well, did you notice anything else? I'm sorry, this is the behavior that you have to train test pilots to do, and it's not trivial. Well, if you want to get good predictive data on complex things happening, this could be medical or it could be whether your car is about to break down, you're going to need data off of the machines. You're going to be collecting data in statistically significant quantities. This is a graph of sleep disturbance as a function of distance from the epicenter of an earthquake. 40,000 people's worth of data available in real time moments after the earthquake ended. Andrew Rosenthal at Jawbone said, you know, it used to be if you did a study of sleep behavior, that was 300 people filling in a questionnaire a month after the fact, trying to remember, you know, how well they slept. Now we've got real data, and this changes things. This changes things, and it means to go loop back to, you know, item A, it means that we need to have disciplines of understanding what to do with data that are, that are much richer and deeper than what we used to think people had to be taught just to do ordinary business stuff. Jenny Rometty, who runs IBM now, said at, at a conference I was at that uh, if you're in a business meeting 10 years from now and you can't contribute some insights that are based on a kind of data science point of view on data, you really don't have a lot to contribute to the conversation 10 years from now. And that may be a very daunting prospect to people who didn't realize they were going to have to pick up that skill along the way. So I began with a Peter Drucker quote, which means I can't have been completely stupid. I'm going to end with, P with three Peter Druckers, which means I must have been really, really smart today. So let's see if I can do this. Number one, I started with this one. There's nothing so useless as doing with great efficiency something that should not be done at all. I have been with Salesforce now for 10 years and 18 days. And during that time, I've seen a lot of people judge the suitability of cloud computing by whether or not they could do exactly what they were doing on-prem in the cloud. Can I move my model exactly as it is? I have seen vendors advertise <coughs> their cloud platforms taking it as a badge of distinction that you would now have the choice about whether your workload would run in a cloud or run on-prem because the same code would move back and forth. 
Well, as we've just discussed with things like blockchain, you know, you would not try to do blockchain if you weren't running in a massively connected, essentially global pool of resources. You just wouldn't do that. It would be it would not be the right model. But once you are in that connected world, once you basically have this atmosphere of connection that we can all breathe, continuing to build isolated databases in the cloud or in physical on-prem installations and then go integrating across them just is not a very reasonable way to get stuff done. It's just the wrong architecture for the environment you're going to be in. So resist the temptation to judge the new environment by whether or not you can perpetuate the behaviors and continue to milk the commercial value of the skills you've been building. Some of those skills, it's just time to write them off. They, I, I will never again be paid to deal with Morse code or a slide rule. It took me a long time to get really good at both of them, and I'm never going to be able to monetize that knowledge again. I've gotten over that. I have moved on. But second, and I've tried to really emphasize this, if you want something new, you've got to stop doing something old. If you're trying to do the things you've always done and then add new behaviors on top of them, well, it's just not going to work real well. There's going to be a certain oil and vinegar characteristic to this where you say, you know, we're, we're working with this new collaboration model, for example, we're using Quip side by side with a document oriented tool. Just today, um, Phil Wainwright, who writes on uh, uh, the UK website Diginomica, said something really good, which is that it is not that tools like Quip are going to go head to head and beat tools like word processors in an intense competition, it's more like the word processors are going to you know, slope off to the evolutionary backwater and become extinct. They just aren't able to do what people want to do and what the new environment makes natural to do. But asking yourself very specifically, is there a skill set? Is there a group of practices that we should not merely allow to become extinct, but that we should have a systematic plan to retire and replace with something that's a lot more cloud friendly, a lot more connection friendly, a lot more scalable to large data sets, a lot more resilient in the face of dynamically evolving threat environments. Asking yourself, what are some of the old things that we should be intentionally retiring could turn out to be a very provocative conversation. And having that conversation leads me to the third and last Drucker quote. Management is doing things right. Leadership is doing the right things. It's easy to be a technocrat. It's easy to say, sure, I know how to do that. You want the database indexed? Yeah, I can absolutely index that database for you. Coming back to someone and saying, uh, actually, at this point, doing this with a traditional indexed database is probably not a really great idea. It locks you into certain decisions about how you're going to use that data, and we really could be using a NoSQL type database and give ourselves a lot more flexibility down the road. We could be using a schema-free database that will let us start collecting the data much more quickly and use it in much more flexible ways, and you may be saying something that someone doesn't particularly want to hear. They think they have an asset base. They think they have a skills base, and you may need to be a little bit provocative in this regard. So being smart is not enough. As if A, B, C, D, E was easy to remember, I'm going to give you something else, and I'm only going to give you one slide on this. This is a sneak preview. This is something brand new that I've only started using this week, uh, but, but you're, you're going to be seeing a lot more of it during the coming year. There's a phrase going around these days of digital transformation. It's not a label that I particularly like, even though it's very, very popular. Because it's easy to think that you've gotten it done when you've really just gotten started. It's not very prescriptive. So I'm using a four-part structure. It starts with being connected. You've got to bring in the bits. This is an engineering challenge to collect the data. You have to create value from that data, which really amounts to demonstrating that you're aware, that if someone gives you their data, you give them responses, you give them feedback, you make them feel that what they shared with you gave them some value back. If you're going to be aware at large scale when you've been connected to massive data sets, you're going to need to use the leverage of AI 
to enable personalized response. So if you manage to be connected, you manage to be aware, and then you tried to do this with you know human brains, I'm sorry, it's not going to scale. So you've got to be smart. And if you are connected and aware and smart, but people just don't really don't trust you, then they're not going to give you the data that you could use to create value. And if you think about it, if you miss any one of these four things, you're not going to be a viable organization in the world we're going to be inhabiting. Connected is an engineering challenge. Aware is a business unit challenge. Smart is a scientific and algorithmic challenge. And trusted is a leadership challenge. Is the company going to behave? Is the organization going to behave in a way that makes people trust it? So I said we got to decide what we're going to stop doing so that we can make room for the things that we are going to start doing instead. What are we going to stop so we can learn, adopt, and deploy the right things? A, we're going to stop assuming and optimizing based on crap data when we are instead going to become much more vigorous and proficient and, and scientific about assessing and adapting to rapidly changing situations. We're going to get a lot better at collecting data that might not be telling us what we want to hear and that might be unfamiliar to us and fuzzy and messy, but it's still got much more value in it than the easy stuff to pick up. We're going to stop bridging isolated chunks and citadels of data. We're going to be looking for ways that we can build chains of collaboration instead of these, these isolated citadels that need to be expensively integrated and that always wind up being you know, poorly connected. We're not going to code by default. We're going to look for chances to compose services and other resources as the first line of attack on a problem and treat code as something we do only if necessary. We're going to stop debugging things as if we were trying to you know, get the last flaw out of a diamond. We're going to recognize that we're in dynamically evolving environments and it's a risk management choice and it's a game theory choice. We want resilience more than we want perfection because perfection might not be perfect tomorrow because the situation may change. Resilience means you're always going to be adapting to the new challenges. And we're going to put less emphasis on making estimates and extrapolations and put much more emphasis on making measurements and working for models that give us a chance to predict and to test our predictions and to learn and continually improve in those ways. These are the things we're going to try to do. I'm going to back up one slide. Management is doing things right. Leadership is doing the right things. Um, the overall theme for the day is not a technical theme. The overall theme for this day is much more about leadership. And I recently had an opportunity for the second time to do a, a, a keynote at our uh, Women in Leadership dinner that we did in partnership with AT&T. I, I put together some remarks for that. And toward the end, I wanted to share this. At various times during the course of the evening, a lot of words got used that some people treat as synonyms, manager, leader, supervisor, whatever. And I thought it might be interesting to go back and look at the actual roots of those words. Because it turns out that supervisor, supervisor, if you know any Latin at all, you realize that this is oversight. This is looking over something. Manager, if you recognize the root of that word from like manual, it comes directly from the idea of hand control, and in fact, in most languages, there's a word that specifically means handling a horse that is, is directly related to the word manager. And the word leader, it turns out, is much harder to trace through various languages, but they all have to do, it turns out, with something like guidance and setting an example. So if you have trouble remembering the difference, I offer you these examples. You can supervise a robot, you can manage a horse, but you can only lead people who've chosen to follow you because it's your followers who make you a leader. And the question I ask anyone, anyone, is what are you going to do today that makes you worth following? Whether or not it's your job description, whether or not anyone asks you to lead, what could you do today that people would notice and say, hey, that is a good idea to retire that old thing that doing better is still doing the wrong thing. There are always opportunities for leadership, and I hope that today we'll develop at least one idea for everyone here that makes you want to do something tomorrow that makes you worth following. Thank you for your time. Cool. Thanks a lot.